All right, so just FYI, um, this session is being recorded um, starting now. So if you have any questions, just be mindful of that. But it's a very informal session, so always happy to accept questions. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I um, think we can get started. We are enough people now. Um, if you just joined, I've just posted a link in the chat. So please try to access the workspace because we'll be using that for today's training session. Otherwise, if you want to use your own R and your own PC, feel free to do that. But um, you'll need some uh, extra materials like data sets and uh, answer sheets and stuff like that. So if you are using your own R, R studio for this session, please let me know. Um, I'll, I'll have to send the link to the materials. But I think it's easiest if everybody uses the positive cloud. Um, it'll, it'll save time. And it's basically our studio. So what you learn today um, will be applicable to, you know, using your own R studio anyway. Um, Cool. And obviously, if anybody is having any technical issues, please let me know in the chat. You can message me directly. But as the session is being recorded, I will probably have to pop the chat up uh, just to see it because um, it's just me today. So apologies for that. The fastest way to get your question answered is to interrupt me. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to just... Um, pop it in the comments, that's fine too. It's it's just that I might not answer it immediately. Cool, okay. So let me bring my slides up. I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, if you can't see my screen, please let me know in the chat. Okay, so just to introduce myself, I'm Annie Yu. I'm a senior epidemiologist at Herefordshire County Council. I've been using R for quite a while. Um, I enjoy building dashboards a lot. It's a, one of the key parts of my job is data visualization. So I've had the pleasure of making a lot of GG plots. So those are static plots, but I've also done a lot of Plotly and high charts and e charts visuals as well. So the difference between those is obviously, sorry, I'm gonna get some random team notifications along the way. Um, the difference between those is that with ggplot, it's just a static PNG or JPEG image, but you can also have packages that will create visuals in R that are interactive. So like you can hover over it and then see more information. You can click on it, you can interact with it. Um, so we'll be mainly um, looking at those today. So the learning objectives are as follows. I'm going to look through what the difference is between interactive plots and static plots are, when it's appropriate to use them, some basic uses of Plotly. Plotly is the name of the package that I would say it's the most popular interactive plotting package at the moment. I'm also going to introduce eCharts because it's also a great package. I think it's not as well known, but some of the stuff that we'll learn with the, the eCharts section of the training, I think, will be applicable to a lot of other interactive chart packages anyway. So I think what we're learning is um, going to be quite flexible in terms of that. And then very importantly, how we can refer to JavaScript documentation to uh, add extra functionality. And we might present some interactive plots in our markdown documents if we have time, but it's it's not too important because once you learn how to make interactive plots, you can just put it into an R document, an R markdown or a quarto document as you want. So um, you can you know you can just experiment with that in your own time, really. But <clears throat> obviously, one of the main uses of interactive plots is to actually put it into like 
a dashboard or an interactive report, HTML quarto report setting, um, because interactive plots are not going to work in like a PDF document or a Word document. So what are interactive plots? <clears throat> so an interactive chart allows users to perform actions. You can zoom in on the plot. They're usually like button, like a button toolbar at the top of the plot where, you know, there's like extra tools where you can like zoom in. Um, can I mute this temporarily? <clears throat> Sorry about that. So yeah, you can interact with a plot, you can zoom in, you can click on the legend sometimes to kind of just look at one grouping if you wish. Um, and most importantly, you can kind of like hover over a bar to look at like the exact value rather than like kind of eyeing it on the X and Y axis and like approximating like what it could be. So they're quite useful, especially if you're making like a shiny app or some kind of dashboard or even just an interactive Porto document or our markdown document, these plots will make it look kind of fancy and will improve some of the functionalities um, for the viewer uh, or your target audience. Um, so there are, they are typically found in, like I said, our markdown documents, um, dashboards and shiny apps. There are, there are quite a few examples. I'm sure a lot of you who have used our um, have probably seen this. There's like interactive maps, which we're not going to go through today. But again, some of the stuff that we'll cover is going to be applicable to some mapping packages in, in terms of how to follow the documentation, how to get the most usability out of them. I can show an example of an interactive dashboard, um, just one that I've worked on recently. Just to show you an example, if you've, if you've never seen kind of an interactive plot before. So for example, like if I hover over this, you can see like the exact count. Um, and then another example. So yeah, for this, like you can click on the legend and it will, you know, react appropriately, hover over for more information. You can kind of zoom in on one part. And then just, if you want to just take a screenshot of this part, you can just zoom in and do that can reset it, all kinds of different things. You can add in like extra things as well. This is quite like a simple interactive plot. There's, oh, that didn't work. You can put sliders at the bottom. You can kind of connect two plots so that when you hover over one plot, the other plot also, um, also responds. Um, so that's quite useful if you've got like several plots connected together, maybe like you wanna showcase different geographies at the same time or different age groups at the same time, you can do that. So interactive plots, they look quite fancy and they look quite impressive and you know they're, they're quite nice to look through for the viewer. So I would say you don't always need to default to an interactive plot. Sometimes a simple static GG plot is fine. Um, there are issues if you overuse interactive plots as well, because interactive plots, they are widgets. They are more memory intensive, so it will increase. So if you put a lot of interactive plots in your R Markdown document, for example, it will increase the size of that document. So if you put too much plots in your R Markdown document, um, if somebody opens it up, it might take like a while for it to load. I've had cases where I've made really, really huge documents, you know, when I was still a beginner and I didn't know better, I made a really huge document. And then the person that I sent it to, it like crashed their browser. So definitely good to pace yourself when it comes to using these. Um, but obviously there are also pros into using interactive plots um, sparingly, right? So if your plot has a lot of data points, you want the user to be able to see the exact values like I just demonstrated that's really useful. If you have a lot of data, um, you can show more details. If you want the viewer to be able to filter the plot by period or another variable, I'll, I'll show you some examples when we're actually doing the training of how you can add in like buttons um, where they can actually filter the data within the plot. So we'll go through that so that you can see how that works. And number four, so I think I mentioned how you can connect two plots together, two or more plots together. If you hover over one plot, the other plot will respond at the same time. 
again, we will showcase that during the session. Uh, and it's just, they look, they look impressive, right? Um, so it's good to just have that in your tool belt. And then I have a slide just around the limitations. Um, interactive packages tend to be less customizable compared to ggplot. So I will go through how you can still customize the interactive plots to the best of your ability. But at the end of the day, they are a lot more complex. They rely on JavaScript. There's a lot of translation involved in the background, uh, whereas ggplot is um, a lot more simple to deal with. So you can, you can customize it a lot easier. And I think the syntax people just might be more used to ggplot. Um, they take up more space, as I said. So with that example of me crashing my colleague's browser, best to not do that. Um, certain functionalities are hard to find in our documentation. Many times you will have to refer to the original JavaScript documentation. So we will go through that during the session. Certain functionalities bug easily, although there are workarounds. So I'll probably be showing you some common bugs, especially in Plotly. We will see those. Um, but there are, there are workarounds, yeah? And if you make really complex interactive plots, sometimes you can confuse the viewer. If there's just like too much going on, it might not be best. Sometimes a simple plot will just do the trick. So in this slide, I kind of show one of those overly complex plots. So this plot, uh, if you can imagine that it's interactive. So like if you hover over this particular plot, um, a bunch of like tool tips and pop-ups will pop up, right? But that's not really necessary. I think if you just look at it as like a static image, you will kind of see the story that it's trying to tell without needing for you to have that extra interactivity of like hovering over it and knowing exactly what it is. If your key message of a plot is that you want to show that the female data range and the male data range is different, just color it different and having like these, you know, like added uh, signifiers on top does the trick. And, you know, you could probably have like a table next to it if you really want to showcase the raw data. Um, so this is like one example of where added complexity, I think, doesn't really add anything. But so obviously when you're adding an interactive plot to your dashboard or to your report, really think about why you're making it interactive because you are introducing a new package. Um, so imagine that your report has all ggplot and then suddenly you have this one plot that's interactive. You are adding an extra um, package into, into your code base. So your colleague who has to run the report will need to install an additional package. Uh, and obviously it will increase the size of your document by a little. But as I said, if you use it sparingly, it's fine. Um, it's just that, you know, don't overuse it and maybe don't become over dependent on it and still keep ggplot in mind. Um, when I was starting off, I had like a bad habit of like, oh, the interactive plot is so much fancier. So I'm just going to use interactive plots for most of my reports. And then it's just like, I look back on it and I'm like, that didn't need to be <laughs> interactive. So, you know, I don't know why I did that. Mm. So yeah, um, learn, learn from my mistakes. Uh, let me just check the chat to see if there are any questions so far. Okay. Great. And like I said, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I like being interrupted. Um, I don't like the sound of my voice too much. So, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. If you, yeah, if you have any pressing questions, do let me know, even though it's being recorded. So just be aware of that. Um, so I did mention JavaScript a few times, right? Everything that is interactive, I would say, is built on JavaScript, probably. So the interactive plots we'll be doing today are, I would say that they're widgets. So if you if you know what widgets are, um, but essentially the R packages like Plotly, eCharts, HighCharts, Billboard R, whichever ones that you've heard of, um, Leaflet for mapping, they produce interactive plots. They're all built on JavaScript originally. So take, for example, Plotly. Um, they are powered by the JavaScript library plotly.js. The functions within the package kind of allows you to 
utilize JavaScript interface using R code. So the R code gets kind of translated in the background. Because of this, you can't have interactive plots in static documents like PDFs and Word documents because they will not support widgets. It will only work if it's opened in like a browser-like setting. So say an HTML document, your RStudio, um, you know, the, win the, the window in your RStudio that lets you display like uh, widgets and, and plots. That's kind of like a browser-like setting as well. Server hosted Shiny apps, any HTML document. And if you've used JavaScript or done any sort of web development before, then, you know, this all probably makes a lot of sense. And you most likely will know more about this than me anyway, um, if you've actually worked with JavaScript. So this is how it works kind of in the background. So we start with, you know, the base okay. plotly. Oh, yes. Sorry, just a quick question. Um, if if you have to sort of, um, whether it's a sort of shiny app or an R Markdown document, if you have to view it in a browser, I just wondered mm. how much consideration do you need to, you know, if you're sharing this with kind of other audiences, people within the NHS, how much consideration do you need to give to sort of what browser they're using and, and different versions of browsers and that sort of thing, or just does, or does sort of, you know, mm. to the package? you sort of handle that for That's you a good just in question. terms of question. Yeah. So I would say I've never had issues with this. It's well supported now. It's not like you know the old flash sites that are now not supported. Um they should work in all browsers and in all versions of um <clears throat> the your device. Um they will work on mobile as well. Um so I don't think I've ever had issues of people not being able to see the plot uh, when they open it in a browser, when they open up in an email, like HTML file. Um, maybe if they were using like a very, very, very old computer, like maybe from the 1990s, but um, I would say it's usually not uh, an issue, Modern thankfully. Browsers should be a Edge, yes. Chrome, Safari, that should be fine. Everything okay, is supported. Cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good question, though. <clears throat> um, if no other questions, I can move on. Yeah, so this is the R code, right, using the Plotly function, which we'll be going through. And then there is an internal function in the background called Plotly build that will kind of translate the uh, R code into an R list. A an R list is closer to structure to the JavaScript language which is why it does this. And then this R list gets translated using another internal uh, function called plotly JSON. And then that gets translated to the JSON language or JavaScript, sorry. Turns into this JSON object, it's in uh, JavaScript. And then it will actually render it in your web browser. So there's like at least one or two steps of translation going behind this. Um, that is why I say that ggplot is a little bit more customizable because it's uh, a lot more simpler. It's well supported by R, whereas this is kind of like a translation um, step involved. So um, the translation might not always be perfect and you'll always get the full functionality if you're you know, using the base JavaScript. If you're actually like coding in JavaScript doing web development, you'll probably be getting more functionality of it. Whereas us, our users, we kind of have to deal with the occasional bug because of this. But I will reassure you that this usually only occurs if you're making like a very complex plot. So I think the plots that we'll be going through today are not gonna be that complex. So you won't be seeing a lot of bugs, thankfully. It's only when you get to like very, very kind of intermediate or advanced level um, that you start seeing some weird stuff happening. Okay, so for this training, um, I have a GitHub repo. If, if you're interested, I can send it at the end of the session, but it basically contains all the materials that are in the Positive Cloud workspace that I've sent the link to in the chat. Um, actually, let me just check if no new people have joined. Oh, somebody new has joined. Um, let me just resend the message just in case you don't see that. <clears throat> So yeah, in this workspace, let me just show you how it looks. Um, so once you join that workspace, there should be a content tab, click on the content tab, and then there should be an assignment um, made by me, Annie Yu, 
called um, interactive plotting training. Just click on that and then it will deploy a project for you, which should contain all the materials, all the packages already installed, all the data sets and uh, work scripts that I prepared for the session. So it'll just take a few seconds like that. Right, let me just clear my environment because I've been working on it. <laughs> okay, so it should like look like this. You should have all of this on the side here in your file explorer. And what I've done is I've split this training to two parts. So we'll be going through Plotly, which I said is the most popular interactive plotting package. And in Plotly, we have a coding sheet and an answer sheet. I advise you to use the coding sheet so that you can kind of fill out the code. I've already filled out the code, so I will be uh, deleting it because these are the answers. But yeah, for, for you, you should just kind of see like mostly an empty script with some headers that I put in. Yeah, so as you can see, we're doing a lot of code, but don't worry, most of it is just copy and paste. It's, uh -uh. Uh, oh, this one, this one's fancy. Okay. So you see something like this. And then you've also got the answer sheet in case you ever get stuck or if I am ever going too quickly. Uh, you can you can have this just as a guide. You can run any of the code in the answer sheet and it will like produce a, a plot for you in, in case like you need to catch up. You know, you can just copy and paste code from here. And then, you know, the same thing for the eCharts folder. You have an answer sheet and a coding sheet. Just delete my stuff. Uh, clearly well prepared today. Yes. Okay. So it should be something like this. Also, pro tip for me, uh, because you got these headers, right? If you ever need to like really like skip very quickly, open up the answer sheet. There's like this little button here where you can kind of see like a table of contents on the side to allow you to just quickly skip to any header in the script. So say that, you know, maybe um, you had to like answer the doorbell or something and you come back and we've suddenly just skipped to like this part. You can just like open up the answer sheet, press this button to open up the table of contents and then just skip to where it is and just catch up. So hopefully that should be quite helpful if you were ever in that situation. Cool. Um, please let me know in the chat if you do not see these contents because you, you should be seeing these contents because you'll be using them during the training session. Um, okay, nobody has said that they have issues so far, which is excellent. Okay, right, let's move on. So some of you might have heard of this um, function in ggplot called ggplotly. So ggplotly is a quick way to convert a static ggplot plot into a Plotly interactive plot. So I did put in some code. Let's just start using the coding sheet. Yeah, because uh, we might as well just start coding now. If you go into the Plotly folder again, and then open up the coding sheet, let's see this. So um, make sure you run all the libraries first, because you'll be needing these packages during the session. Then if you can just run that line where we read in the CSV file of COVID data. So it's just some simple public data um, for COVID is quite old from 2021. But when I was making the session like three years ago, I was using this data quite, quite a lot for my job. So obviously I've kept this. Um, because it was just an easy data set. <laughs> yeah, so the ggplotly example, if I just make this static plotly graph using the iris data set, not, not using the COVID data set yet, just using iris for demonstration. This is static, right? You hover over it, there's nothing. You call ggplotly and then suddenly it's interactive, right? So you hover over the scatters, the markers, and then you can see more information. You can click on 
the legend, which will give you an annoying pop-up at first. Um, sorry about that. It's a default of Plotly. I don't know why they do it. But yeah, you can interact with it. There's like buttons at the top where you can kind of like pan around. I personally don't really use these things that often, but you see, you see my point. It's now interactive. So you can make any ggplot and then just use ggplot leads converted. Um, a lot of people do it as kind of a, um, like their first step into interactive plotting because it's really easy. It's just one function call. But I would argue that, you know, it's it's best to kind of understand how the Plotly package works and to kind of use the Plotly syntax whenever you can. So that instead of relying on just ggplot, because you have to rely on the on the ggplotly function converting it perfectly every time. You don't know if it will convert it e perfectly every time. I've had cases where it's not converted it properly. Um, and then if it doesn't convert properly, you don't know how to fix it, right? So it's best if you can understand the Plotly syntax so that you can kind of address the issues using the package itself rather than a, another translator. Um, so I think that's the whole point of the session is to just teach you Plotly, really. Yeah, so like I said in the slide, good for occasional use, best to create the Plotly object yourself using Plotly, and also it, it will make you uh, more knowledgeable in more packages, and that's always great. So I would say that the Plotly syntax is not that hard to use. A lot of people look at it and they get scared, and that's why they use ggplotly. In my opinion, it's really not that different. It also works in layers. So if you if you use ggplotly quite often, you'll know that there's kind of like a base ggplot call, and then you have like a g on line or a g on bar, and then you you know, you can work on the aesthetics with like the title and the and the theme and stuff. Plotly syntax works with the same logic. You've got a base plotly call. So it's using this plot underscore Li um, function for kind of the base layer, if you will, the foundation where you actually input the data. And then you've got add trace, which is equivalent to like geom line or geom bar. So then you start kind of layering stuff on top of it. And then you got a layout call, which usually deals with the, sorry, with the aesthetics, like the title and the X axes, the Y axes, the labels and that kind of stuff. It's really quite similar. It's just different functions. Um, and the fact that annoyingly Plotly makes you use this little squiggly line when you call the X and the Y. ggplot doesn't do that, which I find better. Um, Make no mistake, uh, I'm not, I don't think that the Plotly syntax is perfect, but I also don't think it's as scary as people think it is. Right, so we can get started on some uh, simple, some simple plots now. So I actually think I included this um, in, in the worksheet. Um, if not, I can just do it from, from scratch. So if we take cases let me just look at the data set take cases and we pipe it um i i feel like everybody here is familiar with using dplyr right um so the from the tidyverse package if not it's just a great um i mean tidyverse is an excellent resource um it, it makes data wrangling so much easier so I'm just going to create a very, very single line plot. So for a single line plot, I want to filter the area name to just England for now. Just England. And then I might also arrange it by date, just so that it's organized. Let me see how the data set looks when I do that. Mm -mm. Yep. And then, like I said, the function for the base layer is plot underscore ly. Um, obviously, I've already piped in this data set, so I don't need to state the data set. And then I'll just say that um, x variable is the date because I want the date on the x axis, and the y variable is um, new cases by published date. It's a long column name, I'm sorry new cases by published date. And uh, yeah, you need to capitalize a lot of that as well. Sorry about that. Completely, completely like I keep forgetting to clean the column names because they're very long. 
And then we need to specify what the plot type is, right? Because we need to say that it's a it's a line plot. So in Plotly, interestingly, they have line plots categorized together with scatter plots, which kind of makes sense, I guess. Let me see if this works. Yeah. So you need to specify that it's a scatter type, and then the mode for that is lines. Now, you might be curious what the mode actually does. Um, you can say that you want both the lines and the markers. If you say that you want lines plus markers for mode. Um, by the way, is the text too small? Let me increase the text size if it's easier. Um, that might be that might be better for visibility. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you specify mode equals lines plus markers, it will actually also plot the uh, the dots on the lines. And obviously, if you specify that you just want markers, it'll just be a scatter plot. So that's kind of what mode does. For now, let's just go back to lines. And you'll see that is one of the most basic interactive plots uh, ever. But you know, it fully works. You hover over it, you know. Um, slightly fancier. Right. Let's try a grouped line plot. Also, any questions about the syntax so far? Just like what I cover makes sense so far. And hopefully like the code works. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Great. Okay, so let's can continue. I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. And the, with the mode, you know, you put a little plus when you said markers and lines. Yes. Is there, like, could you put plus, like, can you add lots of different types of modes together? Or, like, what's kind of the, what are all the different modes? Is there a list somewhere? I guess is what I'm asking. <laughs> mm, yeah, good question. I would say there's just three modes to this. Um, okay. So it's just lines plus markers or lines or markers. Okay. Yeah. Um, can double check in the documentation, which like I'll, I'll show you guys how to do that real soon. It's really like just showing you how to like explore documentation and make sense of it. But I would say that for type scatter, it's just these three modes. And okay. scatter is the only type that you actually need to specify modes in. So for example, if I say that I want a bar plot, type bar, you don't even need to specify the mode and it'll just do it. Okay. Yeah. So I only use the mode argument when I need to make a scatter or a line plot. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. No worries. Cool. Um, yeah, and we can also try a grouped line plot. So I'm just going to copy and paste this script into this next section here. So a group line plot means, you know, I'll have a legend. Um, so I'm going to comment out this filter because I want it uh, grouped by geography, by area. So I'll just comment the section out. And then I'll say that I think it's the color argument color by area name. If I do that, you can see that, uh, you know, this is not a very helpful plot. Uh, maybe I will adjust it to case rate for the Y instead. That looks much better. And let me just switch it back to lines because it looks cleaner that way. So yeah, that is how you do a grouped line plot. Like I said, it's, you know, it's quite easy. It's kind of like when you see a huge chunk of interactive plotting code. It's really just added complexity. Like you just kind of add to it, but everything starts off from this kind of base. And you can click on the legend with an annoying pop-up every time. Uh, you can click on it to isolate specific ones. One thing that's cool with Poly is you can kind of like rapidly double click on one legend and it will isolate it, which is really cool. I don't see any other packages doing that. So I quite, quite like that. So yeah, just use the color argument um, by whatever variable you want to group by. Remember the squiggly line, because that is different from ggplot, I think. Um, but otherwise, the syntax is quite easy. 
And the an, another annoying thing about Plotly is it will only accept the American spelling. So I'm very, very sorry about that. If you use, if you use the, you know, the, the spelling with the U, it will bug out. So that's, you know, very unfortunate that they're not um, globalizing it, but you just have to work with it until they update the package. So that's how you do a group line plot. I think I already kind of showed you how to do a bar plot, but let's just paste the code into this heading here. So I'm just going to copy the, the code for our single line plot into the single bar plot. Um, and then all you need to do is kind of remove the mode. I think the mode won't impact it at all. So if I just change the type into bar and run it, yeah, it'll just it'll just work. It'll just completely ignore the mode argument. So, I mean, you can have it there, but for cleanliness, you know, just remove it. So yeah, now you got now you got a simple bar plot that kind of shows you um, day by day the uh, the case count day by day. And then what I do often, uh, well, what I did often during the COVID epidemic when I was like showcasing visuals is I would add like a rolling average uh, line on top of this bar plot. So what you can do is we can use this function called add trace, which is kind of similar to, you know, in ggplot where you do another like geom line or geom bar on top of another layer. So this is kind of the same logic. So in Plotly, the syntax is, you know, it, it's just add trace. Um, so on top of the bar, we are adding y equals, let me just double check what the column name is called, rolling ABG. Rolling ABG with the A capitalized. And again, this one's going to be a line, so I'm going to say, what did I just say? What did I just say? <laughs> um, scatter, yes. Mode equals lines. If I run that, you'll see that I've added in uh, another another layer. And they've kind of defaulted to calling it trace zero and trace one. So this is like the interesting thing because like I said, it's built on JavaScript. So you see these like little JavaScript uh, um, bits pop up occasionally. So JavaScript counts starting from zero to one, two, three, four. Whereas in R, you start from one, two, three, four. So like, you know, the, the base code works that way. So in this case, um, trace zero means that it's the first trace. Um, and then it starts counting. So if I was to keep adding the layers, it would just say trace zero, one, two, three, four. Whereas if it was like a base R written package, it would start counting from one. So it's like a cute little nod to the origin there. Um, if you want to clean up the legend, which is, you know, I would do this quite often is I would call, um, each layer different names. So let me just catch up on the slides. Cause I feel like I've stopped referring to the slides. Right. But I think that's like, I think that's, I think it's better to just code instead of referring to the slides anyway. So if you want the legend to look a little bit cleaner, I can call this base layer um, daily cases. And then the second layer, the, the second trace, sorry, which we just added, I can name it rolling seven day average. And then if I run that, you can see that the legend is now much more informative and readable. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. One extra thing that I will add, um, so I'll start on a new line here and I'll copy and paste this chunk of code just to show you. Again, very similar to ggplot, you can have the uh, base layer kind of specify what the type of geometry you want. So instead of add trace, which is kind of a umbrella function, you can say you wanna add line, S plural. 
And if you say you're adding lines, I think you don't need to specify the type or the mode. Let's just try that, see what happens. Yeah. So you say add lines, then you it, it will you know, know that you're looking for a line layer, so you don't actually need to specify the type or anything. Um, similarly, if you want to really make your code informative to your colleagues, like if your colleague sees it, you know, they will see, oh, you've added a line layer. If you want even more information, you can make the first layer very clear. So you can say that you're adding bar. Uh, I can just copy this bit. That's why is new cases by publish date and that the name is daily cases. Remember the pipe. And then that means that I don't need this in the base layer. So then I can just have the base layer be the x-axis because that's universal for both layers. And then a bar layer that is by the new case by publish date named daily cases. And then a line layer that is the rolling average with the name rolling seven day average. If I run that, oh, it's add bars plural, sorry. And if I run that, it will make the exact same result, but your code is a little bit cleaner and more informative. And you can do similar, you can do like the exact same thing in ggplot, right? You can have ggplot just accept the x-axis and then you have an add uh, bar and then a, uh, add line, well, geom bar and geom line, you, you get the idea. Cool, hopefully that makes sense. Um, if you have any questions, let me know at this point. So let me just go back to the slide. You got different types, obviously not limited to just scatter plots and bar plots. You can have histograms, box plots, heat maps, and a bunch of other fancy shapes and sizes. Um, Honestly, it's really fun to go through the Plotly documentation uh, because they will have a lot of example code for you. So if you just Google Plotly R, uh, you'll be uh, you'll find this page, and then you've got a lot of different cool examples to go through at your leisure. Um, and obviously, like there will be example code for you to try. Not the cleanest example code sometimes, but it's okay. Yeah, you can do that in your in your own time. Cool. Now we can move on to adding title and tooltips. So so far we've only kind of worked with the geometry of the plot and also like the data behind the plot. Um, haven't really talked about the aesthetics. So ggplot, you know, you'd have like a theme, you have like a GG title, like a labs call. In Plotly, you use this function called layout. And within layout, you can add titles. So I think it's literally just title uh, COVID-19 cases. I just add that. You add a title, it's very easy. Um, you can also add a tooltip. So in case you're not familiar with what a tooltip is, every time you hover over a bar and this like little pop-up comes up showing you like more numbers and more data, that's a tooltip. So the little pop-up is called a tooltip. So to kind of modify how the tooltip works, there's this argument within the layout function called hover mode, which makes sense because uh, you're hovering over it. Um, and then if you, Specify that the hover mode is X unified. I think there's only two hover modes, unfortunately. Um, they've added a different one. I would be very interested to know. <laughs> but um, there's the default one that we just saw, and then there's X unified. So the X unified is really cool because at any point you hover over it, you can see what both layers' uh, values are. So again, if I didn't specify X unified, it's just this. You'll need to hover over the rolling average uh, line to see what the values are. And then you need to hover over the bar plot to see what the values are. But with the X unified, you just hover over the X axis and you can see both at the same time, which is really useful if you've got several layers on top of each other. Um, plus, it, it looks really impressive. 
you do it like that. And um, if you were um, keeping track of the government or the ONS dashboards during COVID times, they used this exact functionality. So I think that they were using plotly plots um, behind their dashboards as well. So now you know how it works. Uh, yeah, so just use the layout function for that. Any of that cosmetic, um, x-axis, y-axis labeling stuff, um, it, it uses the, the layout uh, function. You can also modify the legend. So what do I mean by modifying the legend? Let me check my slides. Oh, the placement, right. Okay, so this is an interesting one. Let me copy and paste this plot again. So during this whole thing, it's really just copy and pasting the previous code and then adding to it. Um, also, let me know if I'm being too fast. Um, yeah, I can slow down if you want. Or honestly, um, feel free to just use the answer sheet uh, at any point, really, because it's it's got everything. Um, maybe occasionally I'll show you some things that are not in the answer sheet. And in those cases, it might be good to kind of uh, note it down. But otherwise, it's all in there. So modifying the legends. So if I rerun that previous code, you'll see the legend is kind of annoyingly on the side here is taking up a lot of negative space as well it's creating the negative space so what we can do is use the legend argument it is called legend right yes it's called legend and then the interesting thing about some like javascript based packages in r is that they will make you open up lists very often um, which we might not be used to that if we're just uh if we're not using a lot of JavaScript-based packages. But essentially, again, it's because this list structure is closer to JavaScript, so it gets translated properly if you open up a list. Um, it's because sometimes an argument for a function will have several layers of arguments available because that's how JavaScript is written. So in R, we're not used to that. We're kind of used to having just one value per argument, but in JavaScript, I guess they're more used to having several arguments, sorry, several values per arguments. So to kind of mitigate that and to translate it properly, we have to open up a list sometimes for an argument and legend is one of those. So within legend, we open up a list and we go through a few different values. So within legend, you can also have the orientation, which we can set as H, which stands for horizontal. We can also set where it starts. Um, so let's say that I want the legend to be exactly at the center, uh, to be both horizontal and exactly at the center. That's why I'm setting the X. What do you call it? The, the X mm coordinate, the x coordinate to 0 0.5, which is exactly at the middle. So if I run that, um, you'll see that it successfully put it at the bottom horizontally, but it kind of awkwardly, it, it does start at the middle, but it kind of awkwardly, it, it's not centered on the middle, it starts in the middle, if you see what I mean. Um, so I think there's an additional argument that I can put in called x anchor. Um, is it center? Let me see if that's uh, what it is. Okay, so it is center. Um, so then you can set the x anchor to center, meaning that you want you want it to be at zero point five, but you want it to be centered at zero point five. So you can see how like um, actually Plotly is very customizable. You know, you get into the nitty gritty details. It you like it's very customizable. You just need to know the fact that you have to open up a list. Um, and then you have to know, you know, like these, these exact terms so that you can actually do it, which by the way, you might want to ask the questions like, okay, but where can I find all these terms? It's like, well, we'll be going through that in the second half of the session. So don't worry about that. I will, I will be showing you in detail of how you can refer to the documentation. That is why referring to the documentation is so important because then you can actually know, um, how to, how to fully customize an interactive plot. Whereas for ggplot, it's, a lot easier because you can just go on the documentation and it's all very, very readable. Um, anyway, I'm rambling. 
Um, yeah, so now I can see that we properly centered the legend. Mm, we could also, I think, remove the x-axis um, because we don't need the, the date here is, yeah. So I think if we say, I think x-axis is also a list. If I set the title to blank, let's see if that works. Yeah, okay, so I remember that, right? So again, another argument called x-axis, open up a list because it accepts several um, additional arguments in addition, oh, sorry. Well, x-axis will accept several values uh, for different arguments within x-axis, and one of which is title, and you can set the title to blank, and then that will remove it. I'm sure there's a different way to remove it, like setting it to false or something, but this is just the way I remember to do it. So now your plot is a little bit cleaner. Hello. Yep. So could you re-explain um, what the orientation X and X encoding. I, I missed. I missed that bit. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. No worries. Yeah, it is. It is a bit overcomplicated for no reason, right? But essentially, orientation set to H um, will force the uh, well. Will set. Will force it to be horizontal. I think you set it to V. Oh no, V sets it to. Oh yeah, V does set it to uh, vertical, so it, it's vertically aligned. Whereas with H. It is horizontally aligned. And then X uh, just says that you want to start at the 0 0.5 coordinate, which means that it will be exactly in the middle because 0 0.5 is exactly in the middle. So if I just remove the X anchor for a minute to show you what I mean, you will see now that the uh, legend starts from exactly the middle. But we want it to center on the middle, which is why we're adding in X anchor because X anchor will say that we actually want it centered on the X. And if you run that, then it will actually be proper center. Okay, that makes yeah. perfect sense. How does it know to go to the bottom though of the of the graph, the, the legend? Mm. Is that just that, like a preset sort of thing? That is definitely a preset because I think they uh, you know um they will assume that you don't want the legend to be at the top for some reason. So the default is at the bottom. You can obviously force it to be at the top, but um, you can refer to your documentation for that. So I will go through this in the second part of the, of the session. Um, so you'll be able to like really find, oh, where is it? So sorry, the poly documentation is like not easily Googleable. <laughs> Uh, yes, plotly slash r slash reference. So I'll just send this into the chat. Um, I'll go through this at the second part of the session. But if you want to do what you've learned at the second part of the session with plotly as well, this will be the reference page that you'll refer to. But obviously, a lot of it will kind of be uh, similar to what we go through. So essentially, you just have to look here for the uh, different arguments that are needed. And then you have to open up lists like this. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not going to like dig through the exact name of the argument right now, but I, I will assure you that it's definitely there somewhere. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, any other questions before I move on? Okay, let's move on then. Um, modifying hover text. Mm. This one I don't really do that often, but good to showcase you guys. I've actually forgotten the syntax for this one, so I will refer, I will cheat and refer to the answer sheet myself. Um, modifying hover text. Okay, so there is this argument called hover template where you can kind of customize what your tooltip um not really how it looks like but how it will present itself so i'm sorry i'm gonna cheat and i'm gonna copy and paste from the answer sheet just because it's a oh let me copy and paste this first put in here actually i wonder if i so it's just hover template equals let's see what we got Yeah, so I will I will explain. I will explain it. 
Don't worry. Let me just run it and see if it works. Yeah, okay. So as you can see, um, what the hover template argument does is it will kind of clean the way that the text presents itself, right? So you can add in like, if you understand HTML, it will accept HTML. So if you know HTML, you know like that the B um, tag will bold the text. So if you ever want to like bold the text in your tooltip, um, so if you see on the screen, the word positive is bolded now because it will accept HTML. It will accept italicize, underline, um, strike through, all that kind of stuff. I don't think you can put like headings. Obviously, that's a bit too messy. But basic stuff like this, you can kind of customize the text. And then obviously you can kind of like, you know, add in additional stuff. So what this is basically is that you want the Y value to be first. And the Y value is the uh, the new case by publish date, right? So that will be 27,000-ish uh, daily cases, followed by the word positive and bold on followed by the X value, which is the date. So then you'll see that it's kind of properly um, organized the text in that structure whenever you hover over any point on the X axis and the tooltip shows up, it will look very neat and tidy like that. So if you want to really, really customize your tooltip um, the way it presents the values, then you can do that as well. I don't tend to do, use it that often just because I don't think people care that much, but just for your information, uh, you can do that. Uh, changing marker color. Yes, this is, this is way more important in my opinion is to know how to change your marker color, right? Um, I might remove the hover template just because it's making the code a bit long. So if you want, if you want your, um, oh, wait, actually, which, which slide am I at? Uh, okay, so I went through this. Okay, and then we have an exercise. Great. And then we have an exercise, and then we'll go in our, into our first break. Um, so first half is almost over. Don't worry if you start getting uh, tired. Um, we'll, we'll get a break soon. Um, right. So with colors, you can either, uh, change each trace individually, or you can just kind of add it into the base layer. If you add it into the base layer, it will affect all the layers under it. But for this example, I think I'm just going to stick with modifying the bars. Um, so for bars, you need the, I think it's the markers argument. Double check in the answer sheet again, if I remember that right. Oh, it's marker without plural. I swear the plural thing like gets me every time. Um, so for marker, you'll need to open up another list. And then I think it's color. And if I change it to red, see that works. Yep, that's work. That's very bright red. I usually would not go for that. I usually would give it like a um, a, a specific color like a hash code color. I think that's what I did in the slide here. Yeah, I used a specific hash code for it, um, which I would typically advise to do because when you give like the name of something, it will default to like the worst shades ever. So yeah, grays, okay. So yeah, once again, I have to open up a list because it's one of those arguments that accepts several things at once. And then you can either give it a hash code or you can give it uh, the name of the color. And then for the lines, you can do the same thing. You can say, oh, the lines one is interesting, actually. And this will introduce a bug, I think. You say, let's say red, marker red. Yeah, now it will add, it will add the, the dots onto it. So I think for add lines, you need to be very specific. It's, it's mostly just lines that do this for bar plots and for like box plots, it's like fine, you can you can just use marker, but for line plots, you have to use the line argument. So you just say that line, that the line is red. And actually what is very interesting is if you forget to do the add bars argument, so this happened to me several, several times, 
fr from experience, I've, I've known to avoid this. So if you just, if you do it into the base layer, marker equals red, it will force your line plot to have the scatter plot. So when you're being, you have to be really specific with Plotly sometimes to avoid these kinds of bugs. Um, when you're coloring a line layer, make sure that you don't specify marker anywhere, especially in the base layer, right? So if you want just the markers to be a gray or red, make sure that you specify within the add bars layer or an add scatter layer or an add box plot layer. It would like for the add lines, you really have to like individualize it, um, which is like one of the one of the more annoying things with plot leaves. You get these little little things like this that make you force you to be very specific, which in some cases is good because your um, code is very clean. But uh, yeah, when I was first starting, because like I didn't really like do any training, I was just kind of like going from Stack Overflow and like copy and pasting code. I was like, why, what, you know, why is this happening? So um, yeah, but now I know, now I know you just have to be very specific. Um, also, a lot of you might also wonder, because this is something very common in ggplot, I'm just going to go back to where we did the grouped line plot um, on like line 30-ish. Um, so with the group line plot, you might be like, okay, but can I just, if I have a group line plot, can I just modify these colors because I don't like this orange lilac uh, green setup? So uh, yes, I think uh, there's a colors, um, there's a, so it needs to be plural and I think it accepts names of like certain palettes. So what is one that I know? Um, testing my memory here. Is there one called Dark 2? Yes. Oh my God, I'm impressed by myself. Um, so with a grouped line plot, there is an argument called colors plural. And it will accept some default uh, color, like built-in um, color palettes within Plotly. Now, if you want to know the names of these different palettes, I would just Google it. Mm, because I don't know them off the top of my head. But it will accept like a few different. Yeah, and you can also, you can also color it by... This is, sorry, this is Python. Yeah, I think, I think you just need to, need to Google a little bit. Um, this is Python again. Sorry, but I specify this R. Yeah, this is doing it by the variable, which I've already shown you. Where are the color palettes? There was definitely an article about this. Wow, the documentation is not the best here. Um, oh, there it is. There it is. Yes. Okay. So it's at the bottom of this article, but it's there. So it will accept... Um, set one, set two, set three, yeah, these ones, um, brown BG, and uh, if you've used the R color brewer color palette, it will also work with that. So you just need to specify colors, plural, uh, brewer palette, and then you can give in kind of your, your own, your own colors. So it will accept a, a color palette. Let me link this article into the chat for ease. Um, I think that was like one of the things that I forgot to put in my slides. So just so that you have that in mind. Okay. And I think, I think we're done. I put in another header for editing the mode bar in case you're interested in that, but it's really not the most uh, important thing. I might just refer to the answer sheet just to show you what I mean by mode bar. So mode bar is just like when you have your cursor around your, Plotly, this toolbar with the set of buttons will appear at the top. I will say that 99.99% of the time, I do not use any of this. 
Um, so what I mostly do is I would remove the button so that it doesn't distract from the rest of the plot. So what I do very often is I would use the config um, function and then remove a bunch of the buttons. And I think there's also a function where you can just remove like all of it entirely. But I don't think we need to spend too much time going through this because it's really not the most important thing in the world. And I think as long as you have the code here, you can kind of just uh, do it on your own. So if I run this code in the in the answer sheet, you'll see that the mode bar is shorter because I removed certain um, mode bar buttons and I listed them by name. Um, which then you might be like, okay, like what, what are the names of each buttons? And uh, I've conveniently put in a link here that has all of the names of the buttons and the mode bar. I, I will say it does not look very intuitive, but essentially uh, you're looking for the name after the dot, right? So zoom 2D will be the button for zooming in. Pan 2D will be the name for the button of like letting you like pan around. So I will say, unfortunately, the, I could not find very good documentation about this. Um, so the only way I could find in one place, all the names of buttons is this uh, JS documentation. So I, I've linked it into the script, um, but if you find it like very imposing, don't worry, just pay attention to like the blue text after the dot. That's all you need to look for. Those are the names of the buttons, right? And they're quite intuitive what they're doing because you know the, the names will tell you what they're doing. So hopefully that will make sense. Honestly, there, there is an argument to just remove the mode bar entirely if you do not like the mode bar. But I think sometimes I like to keep the, the camera icon there because a, a lot of people like it so that they can download an image of the plot. Um, like so, even though it's really bad quality, but people like it. So I will let it stay. Okay, any questions before we move on to the exercise? Cool. Okay. Apologies uh, if it's information overload. Um, this is why I, I try to uh, make the answer sheet as easy to follow as possible because in your own time, you can just kind of run through it and look through the code at your own pace whenever yeah, there's like. Just... Yeah. Sorry, just a quick question about the download button. Like, how? Um... Because my experience of using that previously is it's sort of in terms of the dimensions, like the aspect ratios, like, um, you know, sort of portrait and landscape sort of dimensions, that is kind of set by what your window that you've opened your figure in is kind of set to. And then also it's sort of there it shows as a, as a PNG. Can you download it as a kind of, can you specify, I guess, the dimensions that it's downloaded in? And then also could you perhaps change it from a PNG to a PDF or something like that? Or is it... I don't know how customizable that download, um, the options are for that download. But yeah, I, that's a great question, but I don't think I can answer it because I have not experimented enough with it. I don't think you can download it as a PNG. And I think if you want to customize it to that extent, you might need to learn the JavaScript behind it um, because I have not <laughs> seen any, like R functions that will let you kind of manipulate those because i know for gg plot with the gg save you can actually like give it like the dpi and the dimensions and stuff like that which is very useful mm -hmm. um yeah that's kind of one thing about yeah yeah so that 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 is why i i do recommend um people taking the pros and cons of using interactive plots versus gg plots yeah. it's for certain the other things option like I have, on the one of the dashboards i've built i've got sort of um i have a table where i can it's in shiny and I can kind of allow people to download, um, you know, you sort of put in a download button, um, yeah. sort of shiny download button. And then we've also got figures, you know, built in, built in, in Plotly. Um, is there a way, I mean, I guess, could you disable the Plotly, you know, download button here on the, on the mode bar and then use a sort of a shiny download button instead, I guess, is that I, could you do that? And then I guess in that, perhaps a little bit more flexibility and specifying the dimensions and things like that. I don't know if yes. you've had experience of doing it. Yes, that is, that is a great idea. Um, 
I think to download to download a widget, which is what the interactive plot is, you need a package called HTML widgets that will take a snapshot of the widget and then save it as a uh, PNG or JPEG or whatever it is. And, and, and I think that will allow you to specify the dimensions as well. So I would look into HTML widgets. And that converts your, that. your sort of dynamic interactive figure into a kind of static PDF type format that people can download. Okay, that's great. That might be a good workaround, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I've used this before um, to make like snapshots of my Plotly mm -hmm. graphs because sometimes I want the interactivity of a Plotly graph, but I also understand that people do want to like have a button where they can just download it in good quality. So I would look into HTML widgets. That's great, thank you. Yeah. No worries. Um, any other questions? No. Nope. Okay. Let's go into the exercise and then have our lunch break. Cool. So I think, yeah, I think I'll just leave this slide on open for like 10 minutes. Um, so essentially, if you've been following along with all, all the, the code that we've been going through, this is basically like one of the last plots that we've made. Um, so just using the COVID data set that we've been using before, make a bar plot showing the daily COVID cases over time. That would be the new cases by published date because those are the raw counts. So just have the bar plot layer showing that. And then an additional line layer for the rolling average, which is um, rolling AVG. And then name both layers so that one is called cases and one is called seven day average or um, any, uh, you know, um, anything similar to that. And then just add a title using the layout function. And unfortunately the reference plot has now changed. So this, this link is uh, redundant anyway. And if you want an additional challenge, you can try changing the line color to a color of your choice using line equals list. And you can change the hover mode to X unified as well to move the legend to the bottom. So yeah, I'll leave the slide on for, um, I think eight-ish minutes. So let's come back. I'll come back at like around 12. Um, and then we'll just go through the answers and then we'll go for our lunch break for around an hour. Does that sound good? Um, let, me, let me mute myself.
Okay. Sorry, to the people who have just joined, um, we've covered the first half of the session, um, but it's okay because uh, you come right on time for the lunch break and we'll continue in the second half of the session with more content from a different interactive plotting package. Um, I'm just going to resend this message so that you can join the workspace that we're working on. Um, I will repeat through kind of the introduction that I went through at the start of the session as well, so that those who came in late can catch up in the second half of the session. For now, we are just finishing up a group exercise. So if I just go back to my positive cloud, we can go through the exercise together. Although I do have the Answer is ready there. Um, yeah, uh, did people find that exercise challenging or was it relatively okay? Maybe like say in chat if you've uh, done it and that your code ran fine. Uh, if it erred, then you can kind of go through it together. Pretty good. It's great. Okay, so in case you're just joining, um, the answers are as follows. So let's see what the exercise was. So using the data set given to you, make a bar plot showing daily COVID cases over time. So that means that we'll be using the cases data set. Um, and I think it's just England, right? So we're doing the filter, area name equals England. And then I always like to do a little arrange so uh, to avoid any weird bugs going on. Although I, I think in this case, it should be fine even if you don't arrange the date. Then we use the base plotly function plot underscore ly. And then we say that the x-axis is the date and the y-axis is, what's it called again? long one, new cases by publish date, new cases by publish date. And we want, sorry, we want that as a bar plot, right? That's the first layer. And then I'll just do add lines, but you can also do add trace y equals rolling average. If you're doing add trace, you need to specify the type is scatter and that the mode is lines. If you're doing add lines, then you don't need to specify these. Yep. And then the exercise also asks you to name both layers so that it's more organized. So I'll just name this one cases, and I will name this one rolling seven day average or something like that. Oh, name equals. Yep, that makes it organized. And then it asks you to add a title. So that's using the layout function title equals Okay, any title is fine. So I'll just say um, daily cases, daily COVID-19 cases in England or something like that. And then I think that's the exercise, but uh, for bonus, you can also try changing the line color and then changing the hover mode and then moving the legend to the bottom. So then that means, let's just do the hover mode first because we're on the layout. So that would mean hover mode equals X unified um, we also want to do the legend so that it's at the bottom. So we open up a list um, because legend accepts several things. So orientation equals H. I think that's all you need to do um, for the exercise. It doesn't ask you to center it or really. So you just need to say orientation equals H. 
And then what else did I miss? Uh, changing the line color. Yep. So make sure that you are specifying it within the uh, second trace, the trace with the lines. So then uh, you could say line equals. So remember the, the finicky thing about Plotly is when it comes to the line layer, you need to say it's the line. Open up a list and then um, color red, for example. Yep, so that will change it. Um, but you can change it to any color you want. So again, for the line argument, you need to open up a list as well. Same with the legend. And I think that's it. That's the exercise. So if you've done all that, then you've um, basically a uh, Plotly user now. You know? uh, you're now proficient in Plotly. So congratulations. And once we get back from lunch, um, I think let's come back at one o'clock. Are people happy with that? Is that enough time? Um, if you come back at one o'clock and then the second half I can do, I can showcase some really cool things that you can do in Plotly, like adding buttons um, very quickly so that we don't dwell on Plotly too much. And then we'll move on to e-charts and how to read JavaScript documentation, um, which is a very good skill to have. And then we'll just finish out the session. Um, so yeah, if everybody's happy with that, I will just, um, yeah, I'll just stop sharing my screen for like an hour and then we'll come back at one o'clock. Oh, um, got some comments in the chat. Let me just read through those. Average line has filled in beneath it. Average line has filled in beneath it. Um, not uh, sure what you mean by that. Sorry. So what 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 happened was I, I basically had um, two charts completely overlaying each other. I had the blue one, and then I had a the, the big orange uh, uh, one for the for the rolling for the rolling average over the top of it. Okay. Uh, I had forgotten to filter the area name. Oh. Uh, when, I, when I filtered the area name, then it became a line. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah, completely fair. It's a fair mistake. Um, but good that you fixed it now. Uh, let's be confused about the most recent data. Gray on PowerPoint. Oh. Oh, yeah, sorry. That, that might have distracted you. Uh, don't worry about the gray part. That was just a screenshot from a um, dashboard that was live at the time. Um, so it's, it's not part of the exercise. Don't worry. You don't need to have the gray part. If you do want to know how they did it, though, it's because they had an additional variable that is like whether it was the most recent seven days or not, because I think the logic at the time was if it was like the most recent seven days, the data is not um, finalized yet. So, you know, it's deemed as unreliable. So that's why they colored it gray. And so they add an additional variable at the, at the back end of the code um, to then color it by that variable so then if it's like true then it would be blue if it's false then it would be gray so that's how that happened but obviously we don't have that in our data set so it wasn't part of the exercise so don't worry about that okay cool let's come back at one o'clock then see you all later